I thought I'd start off by talking about a campaign which happened about five years ago now, um, four to five years ago, which I think was interesting in explaining the link between um, having an elected position and a grassroots campaign, and that was a campaign against the East-West Link. And that was quite a massive campaign because there's a lot of money involved. It was something like an eight to ten billion dollar project. A lot of big corporations, the biggest companies in Australia, stood to gain a lot of money out of that road project. And I think the reason why this campaign uh, won, like our campaign to get rid of the East West Link, um, because it wasn't inevitable that we would win. But I think it was that interlink between having elected positions and a solid grassroots and militant campaign and all, all, all of those things combined. Now, in reality, this sort of crossed two council areas. So it was really um, Steve Jolly and the Socialist Party um, who really initiated that campaign in the Yarra council area um, because there was something like, you know, 180 houses scheduled for demolition, um, Steve had been a councillor there since 2004. So there are a lot of community links that have been built up and plus, you know, over 100 houses scheduled for demolition uh, of very long-term residents. Um, so they sort of really initiated things in terms of motions on their local council area and they initiated the civil dis disobedience campaign. But then it was very clear to me and, and Social Alliance that um, a lot of people from the Moreland area were going to those picket lines, even though really Moreland was only touched, like one sports field was touched by a little bit by the East-West Link. So it wasn't like a strong reaction, but there was a feeling amongst a lot of people, especially in the southern part of Moreland, that if we got this massive road, all this um, spending of billions of dollars on this road project, there would be no spending on um, bike paths or public transport. And a lot of people did draw those links um, of, um, you know, even though Moreland itself wasn't directly affected in a big way and there weren't any houses being demolished. And so, in a sense, what we did is we opened up a second front. So, sure, the Moreland Council had the sort of right position on paper, um, and we um, and so what we did is we, um, you know, tried to force the council to initiate public discussion, and so we managed to do that. But then we set up our own campaign, uh, which was open to anyone to get involved in, but it was not controlled by council; it was a community campaign, and. Um, a number of those people from that campaign were involved in the picket lines. Not everyone was, but a lot of people were involved in the picket lines and certainly, um, social science members certainly were. Um, but I think what was interesting was that um, for a lot of the community activists, the fact, and I think the case, this was a case in Yarra Council area as well, for a lot of community activists, the fact that the council had taken a formally position of opposition to the East-West Link gave a lot of community activists confidence um, that, you know, this was a campaign, you could win, etc. And then the pressure from the community campaign also put a lot of pressure on the council to go beyond, beyond where the council was prepared to go. And in Moreland, we managed to, um, you know, once we set up the community campaign, I managed to win a motion. Actually, it'd be hard to win this now because they've changed the rules around uh, motions you can put forward, but we managed to uh, get the council to allocate forty thousand dollars to a community campaign. So we they paid for us to let letterbox forty thousand households across Moreland, and we had a protest in Sydney Road of something like fifteen hundred people. Um, some local activists assumed there'd only be two hundred people, but actually we exceeded expectations, and that put a lot of pressure on council. And then further down the track, um, as it got closer to the elections, um, you know, there was a lot more civil disobedience, although eventually they stopped the drilling, so there wasn't anything so much to do civil disobedience around. But I think the, um, that pressure from the community forced the councils to initiate some legal action, um, which initially um, the Labor Party had said, oh, we can't... Uh, we 
you know, we can't rip up the contracts because, you know, of sovereign risk, which is just a bullshit thing under capitalism of saying, you know, trying to say you can't make changes. If they felt they needed to make some changes, they would rip up contracts, but they want to try and lock people into these terrible contracts. Um, but in the end, um, we it was really that combination of the grassroots community action plus forcing councils to take reasonable positions. Um, the councils were never going to lead the campaign, but the actual grassroots campaign was what really what led it. But the the support that the elected positions could make um, was critical. And actually, I think the same can happen also a bit in um, in unions. You know, elected secretary, you know, officials of unions, whether it's student unions or trade unions, uh, in the sense that you have to base yourself on the actual grassroots campaigning in combination with the official position, using those official positions to back the community campaigns. Um, I've got a couple of other smaller examples from my time in, in Moreland, and one was um, when the Labor councillors voted to cut the budget by um, the climate budget by 50%. And there happened to be a Climate Action Moreland public meeting around that, t just after that. And um, they put forward a motion from that meeting to write a letter of protest to council. And then I actually proposed to the um, meeting that we, you know, that the letter passed unanimously. Then I passed the put forward a motion to um, that we have a protest at the next council meeting, which was only a month away. And it was interesting. There were a lot of Greens people there, and it was a split vote. Um, it was a majority vote that we have a protest, but not everyone voted for it. I think there were a number of people in the Greens who felt and maybe some of the others who were more used to lobbying, et cetera, who weren't, didn't feel confident they could carry it off. But actually, the fact that we did plan to have, we ended up deciding to do it, and, and actually thanks to um, an activist in the group, Andrew Bunting, made, made sure it happened. Um, but we actually had quite a successful protest. It wasn't hundreds, it was probably about 40 people protested. But it gave a real focus for people's protests like for people who were doing the letters and phone calls to the councillors, et cetera. And it meant we actually overturned the budget cut within a month. And we did something similar when the council cut um, respite care for families of, um, with disabled children in the belief that, you know, um, parents of kids with disabilities don't work full time. So, of course, respite care is useless if it's in the daytime when you're at work. Um, and we managed also through community campaigning to shame the council into backing down within a month. Um, so I guess the examples I'm trying to sort of show is, um, is connected to the socialist position. The traditional socialist position is change comes from below. Um, and so how does that work with elected positions, which seem like they're not from below? And I think what... Um, what, you know, this, I think there's no contradiction between the socialist position of um, change has to come from the grassroots. It's really um, the elected positions are actually really to help facilitate that change and to, um, and what I explained with the East West Link campaign, it's sort of using that position uh, as an elected representative to, um, you know, reflect the demands of the grassroots or the rank and file of a union or, or whatever um, to, to put that forward quite strongly and to try and get institutional support for that position. But then not just to rely on that, but the actual driving force for the change is through, from the campaign at the bottom. And I think that, yeah, I think that is really important because... Um, you know, of course, you can have an elected position and, you know, they, they, they can be tricky. I mean, they're not... It's Not all of the decisions are easy. Um, you know, council bureaucracies, um, you know, this is a capital estate we're talking about, um, the top bureaucrats in the public service and the federal government or state government, these are neoliberals. It's, they're not like the rank-and-file workers in the public service. These, uh, the top bureaucrats have a political agenda, including in the council. 
And so they are going to be pushing neoliberal solutions. And in fact, you know, at the moment in Australia, um, when they talk about free speech, um, you know, I mean, the, you know, the right wing are talking about the right to, you know, say racist things or sexist things or whatever. In reality, the free speech that they don't want you to exercise is opposition to the various neoliberal agendas like job network agencies that Owen talked about earlier, NDIS, and this whole, you know, you know, um, these dodgy private training organisations. They don't want anyone to really strongly oppose these various neoliberal um, programs which have gone very far. And they're smart. Um, they often... You know, they, they know to um, try and tie any elected person, whether they're, you know, state or federal parliament or a councillor, in, they, they've, they're a thousand threads to try and tie you into the neoliberal agenda. So they know full well that um, they can try and create confusion by putting forward something which is a big attack with a little nugget of something you'd like in the middle of it to try and, you know, can, um, try and make you conflicted. So the only way you can really overcome that is if, um, as an elected person, you base yourself on the grassroots campaign to break that logjam and change the political discussion. Because if you just rely on negotiating with other councillors and the council bureaucracy, you'll be tied up in knots. You're not going to win anything. Now, maybe you might lose as well. You're not going to win everything. But it's only if you develop that, use your position to help develop the grassroots movement that you can shift things away from the bureaucracy's neoliberal approach. Um, so it's um, so I think the approach with the elected, I think the elected positions can be very valuable, very valuable for the movement, um, uh, and they can assist our ability to win campaigns but not just the elected position by themselves. The elected position has to be um, part and pass, like you have to use that elected position to help build community campaigns. Um, I think also to chart an alternative politics, I think, is really important. And then I think another thing is that as an elected council, a lot of people come to you to talk about issues, a lot similar to union organiser or union delegate, People will come and complain about this and that. Now, of course, you can just treat them as individual issues. Ah, oh, yes, that person's complaining about that again, blah, blah, blah. But quite often, there is a pattern. Um, and there are other people who share that concern, and it might even seem like a trivial issue. But often it's a trivial issue, like some workplace safety issues can seem like trivial issues, um, unless you're the one doing that job and realises that that particular work practice causes that injury. And so I think it is really important to, wow. yeah, to use that opportunity when people talk to you about issues to try and, even if it's a little campaign, whether it's about traffic safety or this or whatever it is, to use that opportunity to get people to talk to neighbours or other people affected by the issue so that people can mount a community campaign, a collective campaign. Because now that unions are weaker, we need there need to be more opportunities for people to experience collective campaigning and we need to use elected positions um, to, um, you know, encourage people to campaign. I mean, we can't run all of the campaigns, but we need to give people the confidence to campaign and that's how, how you build a strong movement. And I believe you can start to, um, you know, attack racism and all of the other sort of little prejudices that um, capitalists are promoting. That's it.